Hello, and welcome to The Debrief from the Business of Fashion, where each week we go deep on our most popular BOF professional stories with the correspondents who created them. I'm Lauren Sherman. Remember when Manola Blahniks cost $400? Well, I do. Today, though, it's common to spend more than a thousand bucks on a pair of designer shoes, and luxury consumers have never had a wider range of choices when they go shopping, from cowboy boots and Mary Janes to stilettos and mules. In fact, a new BOF Insights survey of high net worth individuals, that means rich people, in the US, China, and the UK found that 46% expect to increase their spend on designer shoes in the next year, with the market for designer shoes set to grow to $40 billion by 2027 from $31 billion today, according to the research firm Euromonitor International. What's driving this explosion? BOF's Insights, our in-depth research arm, conducted an exhaustive survey of the market for their latest report, The New Statement Shoe, Reimagining Designer Footwear. The report was written by Diana Lee, Benjamin Schneider, and Rawan Maki. I have with me Diana and Ben to give us a preview. Diana and Benjamin, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having us, Lauren. Glad to be here. Thank you. So fun to go into these reports. They just have so much information. To start, explain to me why you decided to focus on the shoe market. You've done handbags, you've done Gen Z, you've done all these different segments of consumers, you've done market segments. Why were shoes the next thing you wanted to tackle? So BOF Insights, as the data unit and think tank for the business of fashion, we conduct these deep dives into a variety of fashion topics, and we think about those in three big buckets. The first being these thematic pieces where we answer burning questions like, what's the future of fashion resale? Or what's the opportunity in digital fashion? We're also starting to explore geographically focused reports. And then finally, we have these product category reports. So Lauren, as you mentioned, we published our first product category report on handbags over the summer. That was extremely successful. And we wanted to be able to apply that same kind of lens to another really important category. And both handbags and shoes have this similarity where they evoke a lot of personality from consumers. But at the same time, they're also very handy for conveying house codes. And so they're really excellent for being able to build up brand identity. We called handbags a hero category because they contribute up to 70% of a company's top lines, like a company like Saint Laurent. And we call designer shoes a power category because from looking at our annual reports, we uncovered that shoes can sometimes be up to 20% of some of the most prominent luxury brands revenues, whether that's Chloe or Prada. And specifically with shoes, it just felt like it was the right time because our team identified that there was this vibe shift that was occurring post pandemic. The shoes that consumers want today look and feel very different from what they had before. And we wanted to be able to investigate what those underlying reasons were and the implications for the fashion industry so we could craft a playbook. So we could never get through this entire playbook because it is an actual book. It is very long in the best way. It has so much information. I'm obsessed with this market. I've written about it a lot. I have some specific questions after combing the report that I want to ask you all. But to start, I'd love for you to sort of break down the key points that you all cover in the whole report that we will not get to all of them. But like, if you were going to break down, you all did a sort of summary of the report for the website. What are the five or six things that you made sure to cover that if someone were to download this report and get really into it, that they would be able to learn more about? So this report really covers the entire global market for designer shoes. We define designer shoes as being priced over $300 and produced by prominent premium and luxury fashion brands and designers. So the brands that we cover in this report span from things like specialist shoe brands, so like your Manolo Blahnik and Christian Louboutin. Um, We cover fashion brands like Chanel and Prada, and then even collaborations between designer brands and some more mass market shoe brands, such as Birkenstock and Nike. And we placed a special focus on analyzing the US, the UK, and China in this report, as together we found that these markets account for almost half of all global sales of designer shoes in 2022. And all of these are going to be pretty significant growth markets going forward. So the report is certainly very in-depth, and it covers six chapters, and I think highlighting each of the chapters gives a good indication of what kind of like data and insights and key takeaways are found throughout the report. So we start off with an overview where we unpack what it means to be a power fashion category, as Diana mentioned, the fact that shoes 
drive a pretty significant share of sales and also of margins of profits for a lot of brands. And it's in this chapter where we really say why designer shoes are especially relevant right now. And again, that is that vibe shift that Diana said that the shoes that consumers are looking for now, they really are different than the types of designer shoes we saw in decades past. And this is really in large part to the drive towards comfort and casualization that we've seen throughout society, the influence of sneakers and streetwear, and just how all that's manifested on this market that before diving into this report, most people probably would have thought of just being like dress shoes and high heels, but we really saw this category diversify. So in the chapter where we focus on the markets in focus in this report, we dive into the market sizes and growth forecasts for men's and women's designer shoes across the focus markets and also in the rest of the world. And this was with data provided by Euromonitor. Then we contain a competitive landscape chapter, or we have a chapter on the market's competitive landscape. And in this, we map the specialists, multi-category, and other designer players in the market. And we reveal their strategies to compete, especially by trying to balance more novelty and kind of novel design features with their core styles. So we also have chapters on what and why high net worth individuals buy when it comes to designer shoes. And this is informed by some of the proprietary surveys that we ran with a company called Altient on high net worth individuals that have investable assets of between 1.5 and 2 million across China, the US and the UK. So it was asking these high net worth individuals about their behavior on shoes, what they're looking for now in terms of everyday shoes and special occasion. And you know, what are their intentions to purchase in the next year that really form a lot of the insights in this report. And we found that these consumers are very highly engaged in the category. So we found that actually 84% of high net worth individuals in the US, 91% in China, and 72% in the UK have both bought new designer shoes in the last year and they intend to buy more in the next year. So clearly some high growth plans and spending plans in this category. And then finally, this report ends with a deep dive into brands' assortments. And it's in this where we reveal the style trends and changes in brands' assortments that have really occurred in the past few years. Uh, and this is informed by data from Edited, which is a retail intelligence company, and then also Tagwalk, uh, which is a fashion search engine that maintains a database of runway images. And we really relied on all of this to form some of the key insights in our report. And you also, along with proprietary data from a bunch of different surveys and, and research companies, you also talked to a bunch of executives, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we had several conversations with executives to form the insights in this report, and the report's actually kind of sprinkled with their quotes throughout it. So we talked to executives from kind of a wide range of players within the industry, from our specialist brands. We talked to some representatives of resale platforms, uh, multi-category brands to really get you know, entire market consensus from these players of, of what's going on in the category. And then also those conversations helped to inform some of the in-depth case studies that we have throughout the report. So we have case studies on brands, including Loewe, we have one on Gucci, on Amina Mwadi, and several others. And then also one thing that really kind of adds to some pizzazz to the report are some beautiful product photos that we have throughout that really exemplify kind of the breadth and depth that's going on in the market right now and just some of the changes that have occurred kind of in recent years. The first thing I wanted to ask you guys about specifically is price, because it's something I follow really, really closely, not only as a reporter and have written about fashion inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Now there's real inflation because of supply chain and material costs, all that stuff. But if you think about it, 10 years ago, I bought a pair of boots that I think were 990 or 890 from St. Laurent. They were a little pair of Chelsea boots, and it was the most money I'd ever spent on a pair of shoes. And I think probably still the most money. I'm not running around buying $2,000 pairs of shoes. But what I will say is like to find a pair of shoes under a thousand bucks is pretty hard. Uh, designer shoes, the high end designer. I know that you were looking at $300 or, or more. So there are brands like Loeffler Randall that sell shoes for 400, 500 bucks that are good quality. My good friend, Emmy Parsons has a line of sandals. that's like 495, but true blue designer shoes, like there are a lot of them are, that are over a thousand bucks and a lot of boots and things that are over 2000 bucks now. What did you see in terms of pricing and how that is all shaking out, especially as we head into 
whether or not it's a recession or just like a moment of economic uncertainty. And what did executives say about why the prices have gone up in this category specifically? Because I know it's gone up across fashion. Well, some of the data that we got from Edited really exemplifies just how much these prices have been increasing. So we saw from the edited data that prices for designer shoes increased 10% from 2019 until the third quarter of 2022. And that's just for women's shoes. Actually, men's shoes increased 15% over the same period. So certainly but much higher than rate of inflation, even though that is also really high. And we heard from you know executives that many factors are at work here, of course, but there are a few particularly key ones. One thing that we really saw driving this um, is just the impact of hype sneakers and streetwear kind of coming onto the scene. Talking about brands like Yeezy, like Nike's collabs with Off-White, and a lot of other limited edition sneakers. These sneakers being just produced in limited quantities, they saw resale prices far outstrip their retail, uh, with some even having markups like several hundred percent. And not only did this help to lead to a development of a pretty robust resale market for shoes, but it also seemed to kind of condition the customer to feel a little more justified spending just that much more money on shoes than maybe they had previously. So something else that's adding to this is, of course, inflation. Inflation is really having a profound effect on shoes just due to the number of component parts and the intensive manufacturing process that's required to produce shoes. So we actually heard from them that a basic pump can require up to 120 steps for completion and comprise over 300 to 400 parts. So you can definitely imagine that a price increase at every step in the supply chain, a price increase on all of those component parts are going to be passed on to the final consumer. And that's something that we've seen kind of driving these prices up. You also surveyed people on what brands that they're obsessing over. And I was in one way, it really surprised me, but in, in some ways it didn't. But you surveyed consumers and they were high net worth in UK, US and China, all extremely important markets for luxury goods and and unique markets right now because of their economic situations. But they also named Gucci as their number one footwear brand. And I guess if you think about classic Gucci loafer, it is a pretty easy to wear shoe and a lot of men wear it. So it adds that in. But I was pretty surprised that they were the number one. Do you have any insight into why they're resonating with consumers so much right now? You're referring to a free response question from our high net worth individual panel about their favorite brand. So it's not an easy feat for a brand to have been the number one choice that's named across all three of these major markets, US, UK, China. So as Benjamin mentioned, one of our case studies was on Gucci and the style evolution that took place under the former creative director, Alessandro Michele. So he took on that appointment in 2015. And there's a very clear divide between pre-2015 and onward. And it's very clear that under Michele, Gucci became much more trend-led in terms of the direction of its shoes. So prior to Michele, the heels and the dress shoes on offer were a lot more conventional. But Michele came in and he really imbued this distinct personality and romanticism and maximalism to the designs that was really exciting to consumers. So these were statement shoes, but they were also very comfortable because Michele was emphasizing flat shoes like sneakers and loafers and sandals, and they all had a twist. So he was quite ahead of the curve when it came to the combination of comfort and style. And a really good example of that is the Princetown leather loafer, which was fur lined. It was fuzzy. It was absolutely built to be the social media and streets style sensation. And I think that shoe actually really encapsulates the new Gucci very well. And it also catapulted Gucci into something that was more conventional and to something that was quirky and defiant, but undeniably luxurious. And so under Michele, shoes became Gucci's fastest growing category. The overall contribution to sales actually jumped close to 20%, which was up five percentage points from before Michele's appointment. So clearly this was translating both on a creative and commercial level. One thing I've heard covering the industry for so long is that it's very hard if you're an independent designer like Amita Mwaldi to break through at retail because consumers, when it comes to shoes, handbags, they'll be a little more adventurous clothing because they tend to, it's one off. And I think a lot of people buy clothes on sales, so they tend to be a little more adventurous. But when it comes to shoes, they want something that lasts. So people tend to like be more attracted to name brand designers because they 
trust them or what have you. So to make it onto the Bergdorf floor, like a Paul Andrew is a great example of an independent designer that was able to kind of break through and be seated with all of those brands. And now Mina is a good example. But do you think it's harder to break into the shoe market now? Is the name brand important? Or do you think that there is more room for people to come in and experiment and offer something different? I actually think it's easier today than it was before to be able to break into the footwear market. So as Benjamin mentioned, we did look at the competitive landscape for designer shoes, and we looked at this mapping on two different axes, the first being price. So that is ranging from aspirational to absolute luxury and pricing, and that's being contrasted versus a fashion style, which is something that is more fashion forward to something that's more classic in style. So this mapping was already quite crowded, which is what you were talking about, and that's because you've got these footwear specialists like Jimmy Choo or Christian Lobaton. And you also have all these multi-category luxury brands like Chanel and Burberry that design and manufacture things other than shoes, but they want a piece of that footwear pie. So even though it's crowded, there's always space in that competitive landscape for new entrants. And so we actually have seen a lot of contemporary brands emerge in recent years. You mentioned Amina Muwadi that came out in 2018. There's a brand called Pferry, which is all about vegan materials. They launched in 2020. There's also a Match and Match and Marion Park, and I could continue. But basically, those new brands are finding the right combination of price and style. So they're finding the white spaces, or they're going into these niche verticals that have been previously underserved. So as an example, I talked about Pferry, which is offering a designer shoe made of vegan materials. And there's also a brand called Marion Park, which is designer shoes that are orthopedic in nature. So this is what I mean by finding these unusual combinations and actually finding a way to access consumers that have those specific needs or desires. And I do think that social media has this enormous role in being able to level the playing field because there's now this opportunity to acclimatize a new brand with your consumers and educate them and create that demand so that the retailers are coming to you. And so you're also able to sell to consumers directly in addition to your usual channels of distribution. Wonderful news for the consumer. So you two really also get into how the casualization of culture has changed the shoe market. Diana, you were sort of talking about that before with the breaking through of these younger brands. But it is really interesting going back. I'm friends with Leander Medine, who used to run this publication called The Man Repeller. And she's been recently, like just obsessed with huge platforms. She's just really into them. And she's a huge fashion person and she experiments and she wears anything goes with her. And she's like really into trying new things. And I do think I definitely have found myself like going back to wearing kitten heels or just dressy flats now that I'm back in the world. But that being said, I will never wear a really high heel again. Like I never was able to really walk in them anyway. And I decided long before the pandemic started that I was never going to do that to myself again. Not only was uncomfortable, but what is the consumer sentiment? How has the market changed and how is that manifesting at retail? Well, it definitely seems like before the pandemic, this casualization of dress codes, which we were already seeing in workplaces and school and many other social spaces, uh, it was really just benefiting like sportswear and more traditional kind of athletic shoe brands versus designer shoes. So especially benefiting things like Nike or Adidas or Allbirds. We saw more and more people wearing these kind of shoes every day for work, for school, instead of something like a high heel or even like more comfortable heels, like a kitten heel, for example. And I think during this time, too, the attention of luxury consumers was really drawn to those designer collaborations between the sportswear brands and designer brands, too, but not really thinking about designer brands for comfortable shoes specifically. Do you think just going off on that point, obviously on the runway, we're seeing a lot less sneakers, but... Do you think that that's ever going to really go away? It's almost like a driving loafer at this point. Gucci will always, they might have been selling the fur-lined or faux fur-lined loafers for a long time or fancier heels and Chanel does heels. But when it comes down to it, it feels like people are not going to give up their sneakers. What do you all think about that? Do you think it's just like another category that will become more classic and less trendy or less fashionized for a while as the trend cycle changes and we do move into dress your shoes again. So with like the return of special occasions and more people kind of emerging from their pandemic lifestyles, we definitely are seeing, you know, non-sneaker 
categories coming back and taking some share from sneakers. But I think it's pretty clear that the sneakers are here to stay in designer shoe collections, and they're pretty much standard fare in a lot of collections. I think we saw in our um, assortment data from Edited that actually in men's collections especially, sneakers make up about 70% of footwear assortments for several brands, including like Dior, Valentino, and Balenciaga. They're 70% of their assortments are sneakers now. And for women, it's a little lower, like 30% or so. But I mean, clearly we see in all these brands that a large percentage of their collections certainly are sneakers. So as I said before, there is just so much ground to cover and we only touched on a bit of all the work you all did. But I wanted to end with you both telling me what you were most surprised about going through this report. Some of this you could sort of figure out the top line takeaways and think, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But what really made you think differently after doing all this reporting and research? For me, what was really surprising are the exact ways in which we see that creative shift unfolding. So we talked about that combination of style and comfort that people are craving post-pandemic. So we saw that very clearly in our data, where over 70% of our high net worth individual panel stated that they wanted more comfortable shoes. And at the same time, over half said that they wanted more statement styles. And comfort and style used to be in conflict with each other. But more and more so, we're seeing designers actually bringing those two threads together. So Lauren, you talked about kind of the resurgence of platform heels. And so that is a heel. It gives you the height, gives you that confidence, but on a much more stable base. And that's just an example of how comfort and style are really being able to mesh. And so I think that also explains the popularity of things like driving loafers. So the loafers and slides, those are all smartening up. So if you think about how the silhouettes are becoming sleeker, there are more embellishments. And that's also where you have these really fun collaborations between kind of a brand like Birkenstock and something like a Manolo Blahnik. So something that probably would not have been very much conventional beforehand is now almost seen as a way to kind of say, okay, like this is our entry point into this comfort shoe, but we're going to really glam it up. And talking about glamorous, well, heels themselves are undergoing this reinvention where that's become the newest piece of real estate. So it used to be in the past that brands would very much put their logos or their signature stitching on the vamp of the shoe, which is the upper part of the shoe that covers your foot or the quarters of the shoe. But we're seeing more and more so that brands are actually playing with the heel. So you have brands like Saint Laurent or Loewe or Amina Mouadi, where you've got these surrealist designs. So for example, Loewe created these heels with broken eggshells, or they have, you know, flower petals or a soap bar. And obviously Amina Mouadi has a very recognizable signature flared heel. So these are shoes that we're seeing translate from runways to shops. And so I actually think that consumers are willing to become more and more playful for their shoes, as long as it also gives them that comfort element. Ben, what was the surprising thing for you? One thing that really didn't surprise me was the degree to which sneakers have really become a part of this market and you know are really here to stay in designer shoe collections. But I think what is surprising is the number of other kinds of styles of you know real comfortable casual shoes that are also pretty much staples in the market now and have kind of, I don't know, drifted off the success of sneakers, but they've definitely benefited from the same kind of lifestyle trends that we've seen. So I think a great example is the amount of sandals and slides and also like clogs and mules that we're seeing in the market now. So people would get these from like a Birkenstock or Crocs and, you know, they're very like mass market brands. But now we're seeing even up to like 10 to 20 percent of a lot of brands shoe collections being these like sandals and slides and clogs and mules. And, you know, some that come to mind right away are um, the Bottega Veneta clogs, so those Crocs with Balenciaga um, and like Gucci slides. I feel like Gucci in a large part kind of made their name for themselves in the designer shoe world, especially among like younger consumers with these slides. And we did see that sandals and clogs have actually like increased their share of total assortments by five percentage points since 2019. So not just sneakers benefiting from this drive. I think something else we've seen too is kitten heels taking share from stilettos. And then we also have, of course, a driving loafer. And we've seen the loafer now being you know, embellished with designs you know, on the top, on the heel. But we've seen this loafer heel like get a lot thicker too and kind of become more comfortable. So something that's has really surprised me that this drive towards comfort, but at the same time, not giving up style. It's really benefited sneakers and and changed the market in that way. But 
it's affected all of these other categories too. And now it's so clear that you know to have a designer shoe collection, you need to be present in all of these different categories because consumers are they're looking for this wide range of types of shoes, and you know they're happy to get them from their favorite designer brands. Yeah, it really is wild what is on offer now. I recently did a report, the LVMH brand Celine showed in Los Angeles where I live. So I did a report on how their business has been doing. And the show was very 2005 themed. So it was like skinny jeans and high boots and those like sort of Vivian Westwood inspired pirate boots that were really popular then. I had so many pairs that I bought at like vintage stores for 50 bucks or whatever. And I was just researching it after I I saw the show actually. And I found this article from the New York Times in 2005. And I actually think it may have been in, it could have been T Magazine. It, it says fall fashion issue. It was literally about boots being trendy and how you could get a variety of boots. And now that just seems so wild because how many styles of boots can you get? There's thousands. There's ankle length, mid length, Chelsea, heel, pointy, riding boots, pirate boots, like there's just so many options. And the last 15 years, the world just totally opened up. So it was so fun to read your report and also chat to both of you, Benjamin and Diana about this. And I hope everyone downloads this thing because it is just so, so valuable. Even if you don't work in this industry or you don't work in shoes in particular, you will learn so much about how fashion works right now from perusing it. So thank you both for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Be sure to check out BOF Insights' latest report, The New Statement Shoe, Reimagining Designer Footwear at businessoffashion.com. The link to this and other articles available to BOF professional subscribers only is also in the show notes. You've been listening to The Debrief, produced and edited by Emma Clark, Kate Barton, and Eric Bria in the BOF studio. I'm Lauren Sherman, and I'll be back next Wednesday with a new episode. Thanks so much for joining us, and be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. You can join BOF Professional today with an exclusive 25% discount on an annual membership covering key industry topics from sustainability to technology to marketing with access to our case studies, live events, and iOS app. To get this special offer and benefit from 25% off of a membership, head to the link in the episode show notes or enter the coupon code DEBRIEF at checkout. Visit businessoffashion.com slash memberships. Thank you.